Hello and welcome to the 2018 ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide Review Series. This is David Larson at Stanford University and thank you for joining me again today. We're continuing where we left off in the study guide and today we're going to be talking about practical safety applications in healthcare. So let's go ahead and get started. First question, what patient identifiers may be used before a procedure and how many must be used? Well, before we do a procedure, we need to use at least two patient identifiers, and this can include patient name, assigned identification number, like a medical record number, a telephone number or something that's specific to the patient, or other person-specific identifier like date of birth, government-issued photo ID or number associated with that, like a driver's license number or something. Um, we cannot use a transient identifier like a patient location or a room number. It has to be something that's, that's permanently associated with that patient. Um, acceptable sources include the patient themselves, a relative, a guardian, domestic partner, uh, or a healthcare provider who knows the individual. Um, in case of a discrepancy, of course, at any point, you should stop and seek additional information. Go back and verify if there's any question about uh, identification. you got to stop and, and go and confirm that. Next question, what types of history elements should be assessed before sedation is initiated? All right, so now we're talking about what do you need to know before you're going to initiate a patient? Uh, things like recent oral intake uh, in, for risk of aspiration, of course, a recent illness, pulmonary status, cardiac status, baseline vital exam, uh, vital signs, level of consciousness, pulse oximetry, uh, capnography if available, or EKG when applicable. So in general, you want to know the patient's status, uh, make sure there are any, you've identified any risks, and especially any reasons why you may want to defer this to anesthesiology or somebody else to monitor this. Uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of a radiologist. Next question, what are the four levels of sedation, analgesia, and anesthesia? The four levels are level one, minimal sedation or anxiolysis, level two, moderate sedation and, or analgesia, level three, deep sedation and analgesia, and four, general anesthesia. And it's important to note that these levels are a continuum, so a patient may rapidly move between levels. Uh, so they may be in uh, basically at level two and then immediately at level three. Um, very quickly. So you got to be watching. Also, they can reach a deeper level than maybe you want them to be. Um, all sedated patients require monitoring regardless of the intended level of sedation. You got to monitor these patients. Next question, describe the state of minimal sedation or anxiolysis. So all of these levels have a definition associated with them. So for minimal sedation or anxiolysis, the definition is where you've administered medications to reduce anxiety, the patient responds to verbal commands, cognitive function coordination may be impaired, uh, but ventilatory and cardiovascular functions are unaffected. Next question, describe the state of moderate sedation analgesia. So here you have minimally depressed level of consciousness. Uh, the patient retains continuous independent ability to maintain protective reflexes and patient airway, and the patient retains the ability to be aroused by physical or verbal stimulation. Next question, describe the state of deep sedation analgesia. All right, so in deep sedation, you now have depression of consciousness. The patient cannot be easily aroused. Uh, they do respond purposely after repeated or painful stimulation and independent ventilation function may be impaired, so the patient may require assistance in maintaining their patient uh, a patent airway. And cardiovascular function is usually maintained. Next question, describe the state of general anesthesia. General anesthesia is essentially a controlled state of unconsciousness where you have complete loss of protected, protective reflexes. And this includes the ability to independently maintain a patent airway and inability to respond, to appropriate, uh, respond appropriately to painful stimulation. Next question, what risk factors must candidates for sedation by non-anesthesia, a non-anesthesia provider be screened for? In general, if you are going to perform a procedure and you're not uh, an anesthesiologist, uh, then you need to be screening for risk factors that increase the likelihood of an adverse outcome. 
So this, again, includes but is not limited to things like congenital or acquired abnormalities of the airway, liver failure, lung disease, congestive heart failure, symptomatic brain stem dysfunction, uh, apnea or hypotonia, history of adverse reaction to sedating medications, morbid obesity, and severe gastroesophageal reflux. So things that put the patient at risk for having sedation. Next question, describe the ASA physical status classifications. Okay, so these are classifications uh, that describe what is the patient's physical status as they're going into uh, anesthesia or, or analgesia or sedation. So uh, class one is a normally healthy patient. Class two is a patient with mild systemic disease. Class three is a patient with severe systemic disease. Class four is a patient with severe systemic disease that is a constant threat to life. Class five is a moribund patient who is not expected to survive without the operation. And class six is uh, has been declared brain dead and their uh, organs are, are being removed for donor purposes. So the way that I think about this is uh, basically if, if you want to think of kind of where the patient would be. So for example, a normal healthy patient is class one is at home. Uh, class two is a patient who you might see in the clinic. Class three is a patient who's hospitalized perhaps. Class four is a patient who uh, likely would be in the ICU. Class five is a patient who is either in the OR or on their way to the OR. And obviously a class six patient is, is brain dead. Next question. Patients in which ASA classes may require a consultation with anesthesiology? All right, so this is pretty straightforward. Uh, essentially, patients in class three or class four uh, generally need anesthesia consult or uh, probably more appropriately in most cases, uh, it would be better to just defer to anesthesiology to manage the, the sedation or uh, anesthesia. And patients who are class five obviously should not be sedated by a non-anesthesiologist. That's when you definitely want to bring in anesthesia. Next question, what type of monitoring should take place when sedation is supervised by a radiologist? All right, so perhaps the most important uh, element is that you need a separate qualified healthcare professional who can monitor the patient and their primary focus is to monitor, uh, provide medication as appropriate and just manage the overall care of the patient. So while you're doing the procedure, you have somebody who can watch the patient. Uh, the patient must have IV access, and the con uh, continuous monitoring should include, at a minimum, monitoring the level of consciousness, patient's respiratory rate, pulse oximetry, blood pressure as indicated, heart rate, and cardiac rhythm. Next question, what monitoring should occur after a reversal agent is administered? The point here is that the duration of a sedating agent may be longer than that of the reversal agent, and the recommendation is that conscious, consciousness and vital signs need to return to the acceptable level for two hours before monitoring ends and the patient is discharged. So you won't, don't want to uh, administer a reversal agent, send them home, and then the sedating agent kicks back in, and now they're back in trouble when they're out of your care. So keep them at least for two hours after things have already returned to normal. Next question, who is ultimately responsible for obtaining informed consent? So informed consent really should be th thought of as a process and not just uh, the simple act of signing a formal document. And it should be obtained from the patient or patient's legal representative. It should be obtained by the physician or other provider who's going to be performing the procedure. Obviously, if there are multiple providers performing a procedure, it, it can be one of those who's going to be performing, uh, but the final responsibility for answering the patient's questions and addressing any patient concerns rests with, rests with the physician performing or supervising the procedure. So that attending physician needs to uh, at least have, make sure that the patient's concerns have been addressed and the patient has an understanding of the risks and benefits of the procedure. Next question, what are the six elements of informed consent? So the six elements are purp the purpose and nature of the intended procedure, the method by which the procedure will be performed, likely risks, complications, and expected benefits, any risks of not proceeding with the procedure, any reasonable alternatives to the procedure, uh, 
and the understanding that they have the right to decline the procedure. Um, and it's important, maybe obvious, I hope, but it's important to note that consent must be obtained before procedure-related sedation is administered. You can't in, get informed consent from a patient who has sedation on board. Next question. What circumstances would warrant an exception to the routine informed consent process? Okay, so some of the exceptions uh, include things like where delay in treatment would jeopardize the health of a patient who's unable to provide informed consent and you don't have a proxy who's there to provide that. So for example, an unconscious trauma patient for whom the family has not yet been identified. Uh, another uh, instance would be in an emergency situation in which patients' wishes are unknown. The physician may provide treatment to prevent serious disability or death or to alleviate great pain or suffering. So if it's a big deal and you have to act quickly and the patient is not able to provide consent and there's no one around, uh, the physician can uh, basically move forward in the way that they think is uh, the best in the best interest of the patient. Next question, when should consent be obtained from an appropriate family member, legal guardian, or appointed healthcare representative? So if you're going to get consent from someone other than the patient, uh, it, that can happen when the patient has not reached locally recognized, the locally recognized age of majority, in other words, when they're a child or considered to be a child, uh, and when there's a short-term or long-term mental incapacity and this may be from pain medications or otherwise. So if for some reason the patient is not able to consent them, give consent themselves, then a proxy can go ahead and step in. Next question, what is the US federal rule that governs the mi minor's rights in decision making? Okay, so this is a trick question actually. Um, US courts in general establish 18 years as adulthood, but the rules that govern parental rights versus rights of minors vary from state to state, and the states have the jurisdiction in terms of how they consider the age of when uh, patients or when children can make decisions on their own. Um, so I guess the floor is that no state allows children under 12 years of age to make medical decisions for themselves. But between 12 and 18 years, and in some states, 19 years, it's basically a gradual transition to self-determination. So it's not all of a sudden at one moment that they necessarily graduate into adulthood, at least uh, not a standard across the United States. Next question, what are the three factors that impact determination of adolescents' rights for self-determination of medical care? So the three factors are first, legal determination of maturity, and these are made by the courts essentially, or, or by law, or statute, in, based on things like uh, married status. So you might have an emancipated minor who basically is, has, when they become married or uh, has become a parent, uh, or other self-sufficiency uh, determination or active duty in the armed services. So these are things that can make you a legally emancipated minor. Uh, number two, evidence that the child is sufficiently mature to make their own decisions. So, for example, in some states age greater than 14 years, uh, evidence that the minor understands the risk, benefits, likely short and long-term consequences and alternatives, and that they are free from coercion. And number three, there are some conditions that exempt parental consent in some states. Uh, for example, uh, patients seeking testing or treatment for sexually transmitted diseases, uh, seeking contraception, prenatal, prenatal care or abortion, seeking mental health treatment, emergency care or treatment of drug or alcohol abuse after the age of 12 years. Again, this varies from state to state, so this is something that you'll want to find out in your state, but it, those are the general guidelines. Next question, what are the three main steps of universal protocol? All right, so the three main steps are number one, pre-procedure verification. Number two, marking of the procedure site. And number three, pre-procedure timeout. So pre-procedure verification, site marking, pre-procedure timeout. Next question, describe the pre-procedure verification process. 
The pre-procedure verification process is basically making sure you have all the information and everything you need before you go into the procedure. So it's a process of information gathering and confirmation before the procedure. Uh, it's to ensure that you have all of your information and all equipment available before the start of the procedure, correctly labeled, identified, matched to the patient's identifiers, and reviewed and are consistent with the expectations of the procedure to be performed. So it's basically getting your stuff together before you move into the procedure so you don't scramble while you're in the procedure. Um, it's important to recognize this may occur at, m at more than one time and place before the procedure. So it's a, a process and not necessarily a one-time event. Next question, when should pre-procedure site marking occur and what exceptions are there? So at a minimum, uh, pre-procedure site marking should occur when there is more than one possible location for the procedure and when performing the procedure at a different location could harm the patient. So the organ any organization should have written alternative processes for other situations like uh, mucosal services or perineum where you can't directly site mark, a minimal access procedure is treating a lateralized internal organ, uh, an interventional procedure case for which the catheter instrument insertion site is not predetermined like cardiac catheterization or where you're using direct visualization to guide you and you don't yet know exactly where you're going to go uh, or at least your entry site, uh, procedures on teeth, uh, and procedures on premature infants because these uh, a mark may cause a permanent tattoo. So you may have exceptions for that. So again, any f for any of these exceptions, the organization has to have a written alternative process and you need to follow that process. Next question. Who should perform pre-procedure site marking? So the patient should be involved if possible and site marking must the site must be marked by a licensed independent practitioner who will be present when the procedure is performed. Um, in limited circumstances, this may be delegated to medical residents or physician assistants and nurse practitioners, but ultimately the licensed independent practitioner is accountable for site marking even when it's delegated. So if you're uh, the resident or fellow going in, but especially if you're the attending, if you're that licensed independent practitioner, you got to make sure that that site marking is correct. Next question. Describe the process for appropriate marking of the procedure site. So the mark should be made at or near the procedure site. It should be sufficiently permanent to be visible after skin preparation and draping, and it should be unambiguous and used consistently throughout the organization. So you need to find out your organization's policy and adhere to it. Next question, describe the process for the pre-procedure timeout. So your timeout should be standardized and it should be conducted immediately before an invasive procedure is started or the incision is made. Uh, so there should be a designated member of the team who starts a timeout and the timeout should involve the immediate members of the team including the individual performing the procedure, anesthesia providers, circulating nurse, operating room technician, and other active participants who will be present throughout the case. So basically everyone there needs to pay attention and be part of that timeout. Uh, during the timeout, all relevant members of the team actively communicate and agree on, at a minimum, the correct patient identity, the correct site, and the procedure to be done. And then it must be documented according to the organization's policy. So again, the whole point is that everyone who's going to be involved it takes a moment to actively look, make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of what we're doing, who we're doing it to, where we're doing it, or what site we're doing it at, and then they can go back to the separate activities that they're doing for the procedure. Next question, what are potential methods of hand hygiene and which is most effective for reducing bacteria? So hand hygiene may include hand washing, meaning washing hands with soap and water, or an antiseptic hand wash, or an antiseptic hand rub, like an, meaning an alcohol-based hand sanitizer foam or gel, or surgical hand antisepsis. Uh, and it turns out that alcohol-based hand sanitizer are the most effective for reducing the number of bacteria. Next question, when are soap and water preferred for hand hygiene? Soap and water are preferred when you have visibly dirty hands, uh, any time before you eat, any time after you use the restroom, and this is important after known or suspected exposure to uh, C. difficile, 
norovirus or bacillus anthracis. So if there's anthrax, then you got to wash your hands. Hopefully that doesn't happen very often in your institution. Next question, when should hand hygiene be performed? Uh, so now again, before eating, uh, and then before and after having direct contact with the patient's skin, after contact with blood, body fluids, or excretions, uh, mucous membranes, non-intact skin, or wound dressing, after contact with objects in the immediate vicinity of the patient, uh, if hands will be moving from a contaminated body site to a clean body site during patient care, uh, after glove removal, and after using the restroom. So hopefully these are pretty intuitive, but this, you, you should know this list. Next question. What is the proper procedure for hand hygiene for soap and water and alcohol-based sanitizer? So for soap and water, you should rub your hands together vigorously for at least 15 seconds and the soap and water should cover all surfaces of the hands and fingers. And for alcohol-based hand sanitizer, you should cover all surfaces as the hands are rubbed together. And then as the, uh, san the hand sanitizer dries, it should take about 20 seconds. Next question, what is the difference between active errors and latent conditions? Okay, so now we're moving from uh, very specific now to more general concepts of uh, safety. So the concept of an active error is that's an error that's occurring at the interface between humans and the healthcare system. So like in the heat of the moment, that is when something happens, when a person does something and commits an error essentially, that's an active error. Whereas a latent condition is that repre those represent hidden problems within the healthcare system that increases the likelihood of an adverse event. So it's essentially an accident waiting to happen. So the point here is you can't just pin things on the person that made a mistake. You have to understand what are the latent conditions that kind of set them up to make that mistake and recognize that they both contribute to the error. So for example, if a nurse accidentally administers a full dose of heparin rather than a heparin flush, that's the active error part of it. And the latent condition aspect is if you, it, it turns out that you had two vials that appear virtually identical and both vials are stocked near each other in the same cabinet at the point of care. So now we're getting to kind of human factors elements. So again, active error and latent condition. Next question, what is a root cause analysis and what is its goal? So a root cause analysis is simply a structured method used to analyze serious adverse events to decrease the likelihood of recurrence. And the goal is to identify both active errors and latent conditions, and hopefully to then uh, prevent errors from happening in the future, or at least decrease the likelihood. Next question. Describe the process of a root cause analysis. So when an error occurs, when an event occurs, actually I should say, uh, it should begin with data collection to create an objective narrative of the event. So basically go and find out what happened. Uh, it's based on the review of the medical record and interviews with individuals involved. A multidisciplinary team should analyze the sequence of events leading to the error. And the goal is to identify how the event occurred. Uh, so the active errors and the underlying conditions that contributed, so the latent conditions. And it's important to recognize if you're going to prevent this in the future, uh, if the focus on the latent conditions, if you can do something about those latent conditions, then that's more likely to prevent this from happening in the future rather than the focus on the active error. It may feel more gratifying to identify the active error, but it's less likely to prevent it in the future. Uh, again, as we discussed before, serious adverse events are almost never the result of a single cause and often and almost always actually associated with numerous contributing factors. Next question, what should be the culmination of a root cause analysis? So the root cause analysis should culminate in an analysis of issues that should be addressed and a plan for addressing those issues, including task timeline and individual responsibility. So basically, you do the analysis and then you say, okay, what are we going to do next? Who's going to do it by when? And you hand that to them and then have some way of following up. Um, now, of course, when there's something that just has to happen sooner that you don't have time to do a full analysis and put together a task timeline and so forth, uh, then you may need to quickly implement some interventions. They may not get at the root cause exactly and they may not be perfect but sometimes you just need to, to uh, 
put something in place. It's kind of like if there's a uh, major uh, hazard on a road, you, you maybe have to close down the road or put something in front of the road or, or create a detour immediately. It's analogous to that. Uh, this should serve only as a placeholder until more reliable solutions can be developed, tested, and implemented. So you don't want to make this become your permanent solution. If it's something you're doing very quickly, just put it in there temporarily, but you got to come back and really fix the problem going forward. So that ends this section. We'll go ahead and stop there and move to the next section in the next video. Thank you f again for watching. This is David Larson reviewing the 2018 Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide. So that ends that section. We'll go ahead and stop here and move to the next section in the next video. Thank you again for watching. This is David Larson reviewing the 2018 Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide.